here. My name is Katherine Reynolds Lewis. I am the founder of the Institute for Independent Journalists, which is so new. I don't have, we haven't even launched the website yet, but I'm so grateful to all of the folks working behind the scene, to Jamila Bay, to Laura Vanderkam for being here for our inaugural we webinar in the fall series. The Institute for Independent Journalists has a mission of financial and emotional sustainability for journalists of color. And we build networks and connections across all journalism communities. So we are very excited for our white colleagues in the room as well. So everyone's welcome. The session is being recorded and it will be available after the fact. I will send it out next week um, by email. And um, we of course would be thrilled if you would share flattering screenshots, really important insights, your joy at being here in this community on social media, feel free to use the hashtag the IIJ. And most importantly, I'm so excited to be here with my longtime friend, Laura Vanderkam, who is a time management and productivity author, most recently of Tranquility by Tuesday, which is now available for pre-order so that on October 11th, your local independent bookseller or some other seller we won't name can deliver it to your doorstep. Highly, highly recommend this book. Um, I, I grabbed the books that I had on hand. Also, she's the author of 168 Hours. Those are just the two that happen to be within arm's reach. So I'm really excited to hear from Laura and, and um, encourage you all to pre-order the book and share about it also on social media. As our moderator today, we have another longtime colleague and friend, Jamila Bay, a journalist and radio talk show host based in Washington, D.C., whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and NPR, among others. She is currently a special projects editor at Paramount and the digital manager with the Washington Informer. Previously, Jamila spent 10 years as an editor and producer at NPR, including my favorite shows, many of my favorite shows, All Things Considered, Morning Edition, and Talk of the Nation. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. Thanks to all in the audience for participating in this conversation. Jamila, take it away. Thank you so much, Catherine. It is a delight to be here. And uh, I'm supremely excited to be learning along with everyone in this session today from Laura. So Laura, hi, it is a hi. pleasure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks for having me. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. And you know, everyone can be part of this conversation. Like, please put your thoughts in the chat. And I know that we're gonna take questions at the end. And so, you know, very much looking forward to having this be participatory. Absolutely. And I make no bones about the fact that I need to be here because everything in this book, I am trying with varying degrees of success to implement. So let, let's just start in uh, at the beginning. Um, let's talk about your journalism career and your background. Where did you come from? Where did I come from? Good, good, good question. Uh, I've always been interested in writing. I was, you know, part of my high school student newspaper. I'm sure many people here had that experience. Yes, <laughs> I was passed over for editor, though. So, you know, we won't go into that. Um, but, you know, I did a lot of freelance writing in college as a way to make money did um, a year long internship at USA Today coming out of college. That was a really cool experience. Got to start uh, writing on the side for them in addition to my you know, fact checking duties and such. I uh, really appreciated the experience. Um, and then you know, went freelance pretty much after that and have worked for a variety of different places. Um, you know, but these days mostly focusing on book writing, on podcasting, uh, and on speaking. It turns out that there are many ways one can use words um, in a way that somebody might might pay for. And so that seems to be uh, one of my big discoveries of journalism is that we're constantly iterating what we do. That, you know, when I started out, I was like, well, I write articles for print publications. That is That is what I do. And I would say that I write very few articles for print publications anymore, but I'm still writing. Uh, so that's that's been a big change over the years, but you know, we, we learn and go as we do. Well, it gives us multiple arenas in which we can yes. find you. And uh, as, as someone who loves the spoken word, yay, podcasting. Yay, um, podcasting, exactly. Yeah, really quickly, remind people your podcast because you're doing a couple. I am. I have one that is a short 
every weekday morning podcast that's called Before Breakfast. And I give you a short, quick tip that will hopefully take your day from great to awesome. And I also have a weekly podcast that comes out every Tuesdays that I co-host with Sarah Hart Unger that is called Best of Both Worlds. And it is about the intersection of work and family from the perspective of people who truly enjoy both. So we're very upbeat. We've got a great community of listeners, primarily women, but we like men too. Um, so, you know, welcome to people to listen to any of those. I would really welcome you to do that. Excellent. So uh, let's uh, ask this question. Now, if people learn one thing in the time they're with us in this in this Zoom call uh, event right now, what is the one thing that you think people should learn and take away and implement? All right. So I this may not sound like a whole lot of fun, but whenever anyone wants to spend their time better, the first thing I suggest they do is to try tracking their time for a week. Oh, I know. I got the eye roll there. It's like, I just told you to make a budget. I told you to keep a food journal. I told you to do all those things that are no fun whatsoever. But all of them work, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the thing is that time is even harder, I think, to manage than money. Time, it's like all our money was burned at the end of every day, right? You can't repeat time. You can't call time back. Once a second is gone, it is gone and all the money in the world cannot buy it back. So we need to be even more mindful of our time than we are with other limited resources. But the truth is we are a lot less mindful of it because it does keep going. And so it's very hard to grasp onto it. So we have all sorts of stories we tell ourselves about our time. They may be true. They may not be true, but let's find out, right? Let's record what a week looks like. So you can use a spreadsheet. You can use a time tracking app. You can like walk around with a little notebook. Lots of people here who do that already, I'm sure. Uh, and you just, you know, write down what happened. I check in three times a day. I've been doing this for a long time. I find that it's very helpful for keeping me accountable. Not because I want to play gotcha. Not because we want to say like, oh, you thought you were working and you were actually on Twitter for like the past 20 minutes. Like, no, 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 that's not what it's about. It's about being able to make mindful choices. And when it, one of the things people discover when they do this is that there often is time available that they can use for things that they value, but they might not have thought that the time was there for. There are 168 hours in a week. If you are working roughly 40 hours, so standard full-time hours, if you are sleeping eight hours a night, so that is 56 hours per week, that leaves 72 hours for other things. And yes, many of us have family responsibilities and household responsibilities and such, but there still probably is time. And so I find that keeping track of our time actually allows us to have more of an abundant perspective on where the time is going. Okay. And I wanted to say I was respectfully covering my face. <laughs> um, yeah. Measuring and tracking to, to even just get a baseline is, is so essential. And, and it lets us build on the other things that we really need to make sure we're doing. So well, thank and especially you for, that. for, yeah, especially for independent journalists. I mean, in that you are not getting paid like a salary necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it's helpful to know how many hours you are devoting to different clients. Right. That's how we can make mindful choices of like, is this client worth it? Is this project worth it? Should I do this kind of work in the future? Um, am, is my per hour rate, you know, on, on this kind of work sustainable or should I maybe look into different things that would be more sustainable? And, and you can't do that if you don't have the data. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in this in this most recent book of yours, you you interviewed a hundred different one hundred fifty different people. Um, you know, Tranquility by Tuesday Project took everyone through this kind of stuff. Did anything surprise you in what you learned from the way people are, you know, finding how they can be more tranquil, tranquil rather? Yeah. So for the, the book, Tranquility by Tuesday is based on a project I did, which is that I had 150 busy people learn nine time management rules over the course of nine weeks. So they would learn a rule by email. I'd have them answer questions on how they plan to implement it in their life. 
A week later, I would check back. They would answer questions about how it went. Um, and then I did this for nine weeks in a row and measured them on various dimensions along the course of the nine weeks. And I found that over nine weeks, their time satisfaction scores on my various scales rose by 16%. So for any financial journalists here, 16% is a reasonable return over nine weeks. I know we most of us would probably take that with our bank accounts, even in this inflationary environment. Um, so, you know, that was that was great to see. I was very excited that people were willing to do that. Um, I think, you know, one thing that stuck out at me, a lot of people and a lot of busy people are always saying to themselves, like, next week when things are less busy then I will get to this, right? Or, oh, after the holidays, then I'll get to this. You know, I don't know, maybe it's next year or something when life is more calm. We have this fantasy that in the future, things will be far different than they are now. And I don't know why we have that. I mean, maybe in the very far future, I mean, if your kids are grown, you're retired, maybe it'll be a little more calm. But, uh, you know, for most of us, at least for the next few years, if you are in that busy stage of, of building a career or maybe raising a family too, uh, you know, there's just, you're going to, uh, well, we, we can get Jamila back there. Um, <laughs> so um, we, we are going to need to put in, or things right now. Like we need sustainable, joyful lives now. We can't keep waiting for next week or after the holidays or next year. Like if you want to make progress on your goals, now is the time to do it. If you want to do big things in your personal life, you know, figure out how you can make them work now. There's not some magical time in the future. And so I think what a lot of the rules we're helping people do is make life more tranquil, more orderly, more joyful, more sustainable on an average Tuesday. Like that's my idea here. We we need to figure out how we can both feel like we're making progress on our goals and feel happy about how we are spending our time on a Tuesday. Awesome. Uh I I I wish I'd been able to be part of the the, the group because um you know, I personally I, I happily admit I struggle with a few of these things. And and that's the next question um I did want to ask you, you know, uh, of these nine rules, can you talk about which one is your favorite and perhaps is there anyone that you secretly or not so secretly struggle with? Well, I have a couple answers to this. I mean, so sometimes people ask me, you know, what's the most impactful rule? There are nine rules. The first one is to give yourself a bedtime. And that sounds so, so simple. Like, I, you know, we were working on this when we were five years old, right? <laughs> and, but it, it matters. It matters. Um, uh, time diary studies find that most people do get enough sleep from a quantitative perspective if you average like a whole week together. The problem is that for a lot of people, our sleep is somewhat disorderly. And so we stay up way too late and then have to be up early in the morning, do that for a night or two, and then our bodies force us to make up the time. You know, you start crashing on the couch while watching TV at night, or you fall asleep while putting your kids to sleep, or you hit snooze three times in the morning, and other ways that your body forces you to substitute sleep for other activities. And then people crash on weekends, and then they sleep in too late Sunday morning, and they can't fall asleep Sunday night, and then they have to be up early Monday morning, and the cycle starts all over again. It is so much better to get the same amount of sleep every night. And since most adults have to be up at set times in the morning for work or family responsibilities, the only variable that can move is the time you go to bed. And so that is the variable we need to focus on. So you need to figure out how much sleep do I need? You know, most adults, it's somewhere between seven and eight hours. Go with seven and a half if you're not sure. Figure out what time you need to wake up in the morning, count back the amount of sleep you need, and voila, we have a bedtime, right? This is just a math problem. Like you need to be up at 6.30 in the morning. Most mornings, you need seven and a half hours of sleep. Your bedtime is 11 p.m. Um, and then you need to do something to check in with yourself 30 minutes or so before that every night and say, am I getting to bed by my bedtime? And if you are, awesome, like, great. If you are not, is there a good reason? <laughs> and if there is a good reason, again, awesome. You are an adult. You can stay up all night if you want to. But if there's not, like if, again, if you're just scrolling around on Twitter, maybe that's a little nudge to get in bed and your future self will very much thank you. So that is a rule that somebody called the least sexy, but the most impactful. Mm -hmm. um, I would think my, I, I won't have to say I have a favorite rule just because like, you know, 
a, it's like having a favorite child, I guess. But but this is <laughs> the, the next one is the rule that I think all the other rules might be jealous of in a sort of family situation. So rule number six is to have one big adventure and one little adventure each week. And the reason for this, I, a big adventure is just, you know, something out of the ordinary, memorable, intense novel that you're going to, you know, enjoy. Something out of the ordinary that takes three to four hours. So think half a weekend day. A little adventure can be less than an hour. You could do it on your lunch break. You could do it, you know, before on a weekday evening, maybe something less than an hour, but just as long as it is memorable and out of the ordinary. And the reason to do this one is that as adults, often our lives start to look fairly similar day to day. You know, you get up in the morning, you get everyone ready and out the door, you work, you collect everyone at the end, you go through, you know, the dinner, the homework and baths and bedtime and watch TV and do it all over again, right? And there's nothing wrong with routines because routines make good choices automatic. But when too much sameness stacks up, then, you know, we start to have the situation where whole years disappear into these memory sinkholes. Like our brain isn't holding on to any of it because there's no point, right? Like there's nothing different. There is nothing that you need to remember. So we don't remember it. And that's how you get the situation where you see like a kid you haven't seen in two years. And you say that old fogey thing of my, how much you've grown because it didn't feel like it was two years since you, you know, last saw this, this kid. Um, so anyway, we don't want to have that happen. We want to be aware of time and, and feel like it is thick and rich and having two little, two adventures a week is a great way to do that. It's a good balance. You know, it's, makes life more interesting, but it's not going to exhaust or bankrupt anyone. So what is an adventure? It could be, you know, going for a run on a different route. It could be trying a new restaurant. It could be, you know, going for a walk with a new friend. It could be taking your family to an apple orchard to pick apples. It can be playing mini golf if that's not something you do every week. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, sailing around the Norwegian fjords like a Viking. Like it doesn't have to be that adventurous. It just has to be something little that you will remember. The novelty like just makes life so much more interesting. And I would note for people who are in the journalism field, it might give you more things to write about, right? We need novel things in our life to give us ideas. Um, and then the last part of my answer to this question, you asked if there were any that I really struggle with, and there are. <laughs> I do not follow all these perfectly ever um, because no one ever does. We are all human. They're good ideas, but you know, sometimes things work better than others. I have one rule, rule number nine, is to do effortful fun before effortless fun. And what this means uh, effortful fun is any sort of fun that requires a little bit of engagement and active participation. So reading, hobbies and crafting and puzzles, interacting with friends. Effortless fun is stuff like screen time, right? So social media and headline scrolling and watching TV, things like that. And there's nothing wrong with effortless fun. The problem is that because it is so effortless, it winds up consuming the bulk of our leisure time and especially those smaller chunks of time that are really, really hard to use well. You know, five minutes while you're waiting for a phone call to start, five minutes while you're waiting for, you know, the car to bring your kids home or something. Like you, you just scroll around online. That's, what, do we, what else are we gonna do with that time? But there are things you can do with that time. And so if you challenge yourself to do just a tiny bit of effort full fun before effort less fun, you wind up changing up your entire experience of leisure. So, you know, instead of just going immediately on Instagram, like read an ebook for two minutes and then you can go scroll around on Instagram. Or after the kids go down at night, do a puzzle for 15 minutes and then you can stream whatever you want for the rest of the evening. But if you challenge yourself to do a little bit of effortful fun first, one of two things happens. I mean, one is that you're having so much fun with the effortful fun that you keep going, right? Cause it is more fun than scrolling. Or otherwise, you know, at least you get to be the kind of person you do both, who does both. And it sounds wonderful. And I have such a hard time with it. I'm still on my phone all the time, you know, realizing, oh, there's nothing else I really want to do. Oh, I could go try to find a book, but eh, you know, and, and then I, I am not as in charge of my small bits of leisure as I would like. I love the effortful fun rule. That's the one that that's kind of remaking my personal existence with time and getting better at it. But I am a bedtime miscreant. 
<laughs> I will say, well, I've been doing so much all day and I've been, uh, I, I just, I just need a few minutes to, you know, crush this candy or, you know, <laughs> add the dots or, you know, just something to clear my mind. And, and I wind up, you know, pushing off my bedtime. Um, in the same way that some, you know, at, at some people can be told, okay, uh, yeah, the party will start at five, whereas other people, you need to say, okay, you need to get the balloons, you get the, eh. for those of us who are bedtime miscreants, who will blue light our, ourselves to the next sunrise, are there any like rules or even gamification strategies to get us not just in bed, but in bed without our phones and in bed with our eyes closed, preferably in the time that we said we wanted to be doing such? Yeah. Well, if there are things that you truly enjoy doing before bed, build them into your bedtime routine, right? So if you enjoy a good run of Candy Crush, you know, in the evening, put it in there, right? Say like, okay, maybe I need to be in bed at 11. I want to be playing Candy Crush at 9.45 PM, right? And, and then allow yourself to play for, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes, and then, you know, brush your teeth. And then after that, it's, you know, reading or something time just to start, you know, getting off the screens and, and getting in. But there's no reason to not have leisure time that you love, right? If there is something you truly enjoy doing, I want you to build it into your life. And one of the reasons people stay up late to get this time is because they feel like they're not getting enough of it the rest of the day. But if that's the case, I want you to build it in. Like, I want you to build it into other times of your life as well. Like, look at what you are doing. Are there spots during the day where you could proactively put in these activities that you do enjoy? Like, maybe you can take a real lunch break, right? So I, a lot of us are like, oh, I'm just going to get through my email. Like, your email is going to keep coming in. Like, there, you will never get to the bottom of your inbox, right? Like, email expands to fill all available space. So why not take 20 minutes and do something else, whatever that is. If it's reading, I mean, it could be playing Candy Crush. But, it, you know, whatever it is, like, give yourself spots of, chosen leisure during the day, doing those things that you would stay up later doing, right? Because I don't want people to feel like they have to give them up, right? I want people to feel like they get to do them and they're getting enough sleep. Because remember, I mean, we say bedtime miscreants. Most people, you know, people who are not chronic insomniacs often have a very strong sleep set point. Like there is some amount of sleep that your body needs and one way or another, you are going to get there over you know a reasonable period of time which means that by skimping on sleep you don't actually make time you just shove it somewhere else right so it might be that you spend more of your weekend hours asleep then than you might otherwise choose to you've just moved it from the week to the weekend or you've moved it to a day that you crash early or moved it to a day that you sleep later than you intend to and you know as <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. All right. So we, um, you know, that was, they wanted Jamila to go, go to bed here. <laughs> I get the lights out. <laughs> lights out. <laughs> lights out time. Yeah. We're going to force it. But yeah, you know, it, it's, it's setting the start of the wind down period early enough that you can build in these luxurious fun for you sort of things and still get to bed on time and making sure you have time for leisure at other points during the day. Oh, Okay. I'm, I, it's a, it's a process and it's a process I'm going to continue to work with. Okay. Yay. So we on this, on this call, uh, are mostly freelance journalists, writers of the sort. Um, we, a lot of us live by our deadlines and, uh, I want you to talk about what you found in terms of the way deadlines can impact our relationships um, and how that uh, deals with the time that we spend with families. I will, I will concede. I am a lot snippier with my teenager than I want to be, especially when it's like getting close to turn in point and I'm still working. Um, can you talk about, about that and, and some of the ways that we can perhaps be gentler all around in doing that? It, this is very much one of those I know what to do, but I need that reinforcement to make sure that I remind myself in those moments. 
Yeah, well, one of the best things you can do is to not have deadlines feel quite so deadly. Um, and to do that, we need to have enough space before them that we are not feeling quite so frantic as we get close to them. And one of the ways you can do this is actually rule number five, which is create a backup slot, which means really just to build open space into your life in general, right? We need more space so that when something goes wrong, we are still on track to do things on time and not feeling frantic. So for instance, if you have something big due Thursday, it feels really, really good to be done with it, like Monday or Tuesday. And then you have time to either come back to it, you know, think about it a little bit more and still turn it in on Thursday. Or what often happens, you have to turn it in on Thursday. You know, you're planning on working on it Monday and Tuesday, you know, maybe even Tuesday and Wednesday. But what happens? Like there's a huge something goes massively wrong on Wednesday, right? Like you're sick, a kid is sick or, you know, what? it's just like you, you lose that time. Let's say that happens on Tuesday and you were counting on Tuesday to do the assignment. Well, if you still have Wednesday, you know, we still have that time. We still might be able to meet our deadline, even though something didn't go exactly right. You know, a lot of people plan their schedules such that everything needs to go perfectly in order for things to work. But like, Anyone can create a perfect schedule. I think the true time management masters are the ones that create a resilient schedule where things still happen as they should, even when life does not happen as it should, because life never does happen exactly as it should. There's something always comes up. You know this, right? We all know this. And it's not always bad stuff, right? It's not always bad stuff. Sometimes there's really awesome stuff that comes into our lives and we want to do it. Right. Like if if you, you know, are have that huge deadline on Thursday and on Wednesday, you know, you get an assignment from a brand new place that you've been trying to work for forever. Like, wouldn't it be nice to be able to take that on? Right. Not be like, oh, yeah, I still have to do this other thing. You know, it's it, it, it if you had, you know, built in the open space and finished things ahead of time, then then when that new wonderful opportunity came up then you know the time is there. Uh, you have that slot that's, that's available. Now, obviously it is not easy to build open space into a busy life. Um, if you have some amount of control over your time, designating one open day per week is really helpful. I try to leave Fridays as open as possible. We're, we're here now, but uh, you know, I often try to leave Fridays pretty open because um, it allows me to catch up on stuff. Um, and you know, if, if, that's not doable. Maybe it's two afternoons a week, right? Like you do your best to not schedule anything Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. And that, you know, it's not going to be, you don't get the time off. Like, like don't go book your spa visit, right? Like don't, don't get a, you know, time on the golf course for those times. What they're there for is when things go wrong, they can absorb the overflow. Mm -hmm. Or if things go fabulously right, now you have time to take that opportunity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what you got to do. Okay. Now we honor labor. We value creation. Yet when what we do doesn't necessarily look like labor, if it looks like, you know, women's work, to use that, it, 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 the phrase is problematic. We're using it for the purposes of this question. Um, but it sometimes gets shunted aside or even ignored in our households. So for those of us who my process requires that I stare at the dot on the popcorn ceiling, it really helps me to do this. But when, when I'm doing that in, in the furtherance of my creative work and, and, and my writing, um, sometimes the family then thinks, oh, oh, she's just staring at the ceiling. It's time to remind her of all this other stuff that we need to do because she's not doing anything. How do you think, how, how have you found that people can be successful in setting boundaries around the work that we do, particularly for those of us who are working at home with our families around us? Well, you know, the, the easiest solution is a door, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would highly encourage anyone who is working from home to have a space with a door. So if you are staring at the dot on the ceiling, nobody knows 
like nobody can see you. Nobody can judge whether what you're doing looks like work or not because the door is closed. And so then you make your own piece with however you need to spend the time that you are in there. Um, but I would also suggest that, um, you know, this, this sort of depends on, on age of children, but if you have children who are young enough not to respect a, you know, like recording sign on the door or, you know, like do not disturb, or even, you know, respect a shut door, right? If their children are young enough that they can't really get that, then you cannot be the adult in charge of them during the hours you intend to work. Now, I don't mean that you need like, you know, full-time childcare because many people don't want to, but you cannot be the adult in charge of those young children during the hours you intend to work without it being a problem because you'll feel pulled in a million different directions. Like it's very hard to focus when your kids need something and then you'll be snippy with the kids and, you know, it's not their fault. You know, they're young and they need stuff, right? So childcare, it's an amazing thing. It really is. And I know a lot of people feel sort of, um, you know, like, is it worth investing the money in it? But that's what it is. It's an investment. Like if you're running any other sort of business, right? It'd be like, oh, well, I don't know if I really want to build that factory. I mean, you know, like what if I, I, you know, it seems like a little indulgent to build that factory to make my products, right? No, it's not how you think about any other sort of business investment. And so it is the same thing with childcare. Um, you know, having a dedicated amount of time to work without, you know, with somebody else in charge of the kids is, is that, um, you know, so the, the, as for, you know, setting boundaries with older people who, uh, don't need childcare, you know, sometimes it's a tempting thought, but, you know, older people who, who don't need that, um, this, this is just, I think it's as much about you're taking yourself seriously as it is about anything else, because, if you are staring at the ceiling and somebody comes up to you and asks for something, if you're like, mm, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. But if you're just like, um, sorry, excuse me, I'm, I'm working, I will get back to you in you know, 90 minutes and then I can deal with that or whatever it is. Like people do start to respect that more over time um, when you are very clear that what I am doing is important. You know, this is work. This is real work. It's work like any other work. Like I could show you the checks if you want. <laughs> Right. I'll show you the money going into the bank account. Um, and and so, you know, having that sense of our own pride and, and just being firm about that is, is helpful. Absolutely. OK, so we're definitely going to have some time for Q&A. I want to I want to ask a, a couple ending questions and then we'll we'll open it up. So, folks, please feel free. Uh, use that Q&A box, get your questions in there and we'll get as many answered as we can coming up. Um, okay, bedtime helps a lot of people. Is there another particular, uh, you know, a, a particular activity, rule, whatnot that you find helps the widest variety of folks? There are as many systems as there are people. Yeah. Yeah. I bet bedtime would help a lot for me and most of us. Anything yeah. in addition? Bedtime would help a lot. Well, here's something batching the little things. So this is rule number eight. And many of us wind up with small degree, you know, small tasks on our plates that we have to do. They're not particularly urgent, nor are they particularly important, but we still have to do them. So various non-urgent responses to, you know, invitations and the like, um, filling out those endless permission slips or signing kids up for stuff. Uh, maybe it's filling out some sort of work form that you need to sending invoices or bills or, you know, paying bills. These are, these are all things that we have to do, but they are not particularly urgent or important in most of the cases. Like, you know, you do need to get to them, but it's, it's not, you know, right. The biggest thing to do at any given point. So what happens? Well, you know, when we have a long list of these little things, we can feel very oppressed, right? We feel like, oh, I'm always doing the little things. I have such a, you know, huge amount of stuff to do. Uh, woe is me. And you feel like you spend your life doing them. And the problem is, you know, I, we, we can talk about like that, you know, it may be unequal how, how this, this work is distributed in life. That is absolutely true. But however it is distributed, Making sure that it doesn't take over your life goes a long way toward feeling more tranquil, feeling like we have the time to work and feeling like we have the time to relax. So learn to recognize these small tasks and then designate a window when you will get to all of them. 
And in general, it should be a window when you are not at your best. <laughs> so like for many people, it's mid-afternoon, right? Like in morning, tend, people tend to have more energy and discipline and focus. So that's a really great time to work on, you know, your long-term assignments, like it, building up your career. That's not really a great time for filling out the permission slip. You do that sort of like 2.30 in the afternoon when you're like really just kind of, uh, otherwise you'd just be reading the same email six times in a row. That's a good time for doing all those little things. Or you can do a bigger batch window during the week. Another thing I try to do on Friday, I have my Friday punch list, right? And I try to get through the Friday punch list and it's all the bills, it's all the responses, it's all the you know little things that I haven't done during the rest of the week. And it kind of feels good because I'm like crossing one off every minute or two and like, woohoo, go me. But the reason to do this, you know, one is it, it, you know, we know we will get to them. We don't feel guilty about not doing them. It, but the, the funny thing about many of these small tasks is sometimes we kind of secretly like to do them, right? It's a really good way to procrastinate. Like maybe you're really struggling with an assignment. It's kind of hard. You have to do more things. You really got to think about it. You're like, ah, oh, working on it, work on it. Oh, or I could just go order that birthday present on Amazon, right? And then <laughs> you pull yourself away from it or, you know, oh, well, you know what? My colleague needs this information. Let me just go email her. And of course, then you're in your inbox with all the other shiny new unread messages that you're looking at as well. So by designating a window, you deprive yourself sometimes of that easy win and you allow yourself to spend the time on focused work. We can do this for general household chores too. I always suggest people create like a chore window. If you are, you know, you can lose your whole weekend to chores, but maybe you say like, okay, chore window is let's say 10 to noon on Saturday. And this does two things. I mean, one, it forces efficiencies. Like if it didn't happen in the 10 to noon window, it probably wasn't that vital, right? Like it wasn't the, the biggest thing you saw. Um, but also if you find yourself looking at a dirty floor at some point other than 10 to noon, you can tell yourself, hey, there's the time for that. Now is not that time. And then you can let yourself relax. Okay. So Friday, that's your open kind of day. You also suggest in the book that Friday is your day to plan your week. Now, why Friday? I, I have been a consummate Sunday planner. It doesn't always work. I will concede. But what, what's the advantage of planning it on Friday? Well, so if the, this rule to plan on Fridays is two things. One is to plan. Like that is the most important part. So mm -hmm. I think everyone needs a designated weekly planning time. I don't truly care when you do it. So if Sunday night is great for you, by all means, stick with it. If you have some other time, like perhaps you are a Tuesday noon planner, if that is the case, like, I don't know why, but go for it, right? Like, you know, if it works for you, it works. So the reason for Friday though, is a couple of things. I mean, one, I would say, you know, when people get off this webinar, how many, I, I know we're very inspiring, but I'm guessing most people are not going to be like, woohoo, I am excited to make progress on my personal and professional priorities right now at 2 p.m. on Friday afternoon. Like most people are kind of sliding into the weekend by that point, right? It's really hard to start something new, but we might be willing to think about what future us should be doing. And so taking a few minutes to plan on Friday afternoon can turn what might be wasted time into some of our most productive minutes of the week. Another upside of Friday versus Monday morning, which is another time that a lot of people plan, is that it allows you to use all of Monday, right? So if you plan on if you plan on Monday morning, like you won't really be able to start most of the stuff until later in the day on Monday. Like if you have to set things up, if you have to you know call people, set appointments, you're not going to get to that stuff till later. And so you haven't used much of Monday. And if Friday's kind of a wash for many people, we only have like a three day work week then. Whereas if you plan on Friday, you can use all of Monday. The time, the business upside, one upside versus Sunday night. If you need to set an appointment, if you need to set up a meeting with someone, like they're more likely to be at their desk and places with business hours are open on Friday afternoon and they are not generally on Sunday night, right? Many people don't, you know, check their email on Sunday night or don't want to <laughs> check their email on Sunday night and such. Uh, but I think the biggest reason, you know, even people who really love their work, if you are planning on Sunday night. Sometimes you can wind up with a little bit of trepidation towards Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, where you are feeling like, oh, I know there's all this stuff waiting for me on Monday morning. I know there is. And yet I don't know exactly how I'm going to deal with it. And so if you don't have a plan, the back of your brain is constantly churning through it, right? You can feel a little bit of anxiety about it. Whereas if you end work on Friday, 
with a plan for the week, you know, including knowing what you're going to do Monday, knowing how you're going to tackle all that stuff. It allows you to relax and hopefully enjoy your weekend more. Excellent. Okay. I get my weekend that that's that'll I'm going to try Friday. Okay. I'm going to try, try it. Okay. We'll see if anyone else on this, on this webinar wants to try it. That would be great. If you Lovely. do try Friday planning, let me know, right? If you, <laughs> if you normally would do this Sunday night or Monday morning, maybe try doing it when you get off this, you know, zoom call here and you can, you can let me know, you know, Laura at lauravandercam.com. I always like to hear. <laughs> okay. Laura at lauravandercam.com. You're getting a message from me at least. All right. I'll check okay. in. Okay. <laughs> so let's uh, hop into some of the questions that the audience has shared. Uh, I'm going to read through as many of these as we can get and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So I want to start with someone who says, ironically, my biggest time management challenges come when I have fewer projects and deadlines. Do you have tips to, you know, keep the good time stuff going during those more dry periods? Yeah. yeah so it's, it's hard to use bigger amounts of time. Well, and, and many people have this issue, like when they retire, for instance, they're like, wait a minute, I was looking forward to all my free time and now I don't know what to do with it. Like that's actually a pretty frequent question I get. Um, now, obviously, if you're still working, sometimes, you know, slower moments can feel a little bit anxiety producing if you are not sure that you will, you know, make whatever your revenue targets are. But let's, let's say that you're going to, okay? It's just that things are a little bit light. It's not that you're concerned about, you know, exactly what, what you're going to make that particular month. I think a couple of things to do. One is just, you know, be in the habit of thinking through what you would like to do with extra time. Like often, you know, the, it, you know, often that when we are, um, let's see how I'm going to uh, put this, you know, when we're so busy, we assume that we have no time. And so we don't think about how we want to spend our time. And so when time does appear, we don't, we'd spend it on whatever is right in front of us, right? We, we don't put a whole lot of mindfulness into this. But if you take some time to think about what I would like to do, well, then you have ready answers. And in, when you have some available time, you can start plotting this into your week, you know, as a big adventure and a little adventure, or as, you know, some hobby time or things like that. So make a list. You know, one of the things I always have people do is have a, you know, a list of a hundred dreams. So anything you might want to spend more time doing in your life. And of course, some of it, the, the first part is always going to be the big stuff. Like, oh, I want to take a three-week trip to Fiji. Okay, that can go on the list. But like maybe eventually you're getting to stuff that's more like, well, I want to try singing karaoke with my friends who do that. Or, you know, I want to learn to bake a better banana bread. Or I, I want to, um, you know, try to jump a hundred jumps in a row on a pogo stick. I don't know, whatever it is that you want to do like make a long list. And then you can start, um, you know, getting, uh, putting a couple of these every week, you know, just a couple, you don't have to go overboard, but maybe two or three a week into this open time that you have. And, you know, you'll be busy, you know, busy again soon enough. Um, but, but this can allow you to feel like you are enjoying time more uh, instead of just having it pass by. Okay. So someone asked, uh, you know, planning is one thing and that's essential, but do you have suggestions around building in time for quarterly or monthly reviews or self-reflection? Um, they say they get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, but, uh, you know, building in time to reflect about how, how the business, the freelancing is going and what's doing well and what to do more of, um, how to plan for that kind of reflection time? Yeah. So, I mean, this can add on very well to Friday planning, right? So that you more regularly, you know, as you are planning the upcoming week, you can, of course, look back over the previous week and ask yourself how it went, right? Like, what are you happy about? What are you not happy about? You know, what did you like? And, you know, what do you want to do more of? So that's a very easy way to sort of add in just a few minutes of reflection time. If we're thinking a little bit more broadly, um, sometimes it helps to, you know, give yourself an actual retreat. Uh, it could be, you know, a day, you designate a day, maybe you go somewhere a little different, you, you are not, don't normally work. I mean, it can just be a library. It doesn't have to be, you know, like you rent a fancy hotel room, though, if you would like to, by all means, <laughs> you know, I would, I would highly encourage that. Um, but, you know, just go sit in the library and 
you know, come in with a handful of questions that you want to ask yourself. Like, I think when we go into a day and are like, I'm going to think deep thoughts, like that's really hard to do. <laughs> you're not going <laughs> to feel like you're using the time well, but maybe you can ask yourself four questions like, which of my clients am I most happy with? How can I do more work for them? Do I want to get rid of any of my clients? What could I do to hit my next revenue goal for the next quarter? You know, just very specific questions like that. And then think through those answers over the course of the day. And hopefully you'll have some great insights. Um, you know, you could do this every quarter, take a day to do this. I mean, you could even just do it every six months, but it's important to do some of it. Like, because if we don't ever reflect on the business and where it's going, then we won't do it. We'll just keep doing what's right in front of us. Like what's the most obvious next thing. And maybe that's not always the right thing to do. Um, so, you know, ask yourself that question. And, and if you build in some space to do that somewhat regularly, you can start having that longer term perspective. I want to add a couple of themes have come up and I'm going to uh, ask a combined question. Okay. So um, for, for times when someone is feeling just overwhelmed and scattered and the, the, the directions are pulling them every which way, how to, how is there a way to kind of task manage and figure out, you know, okay, here's, here's how to discern what I need to be doing because I need to be doing everything. Um, <laughs> Is there a way to figure that out? Um, and then uh, the next question that I want to add on to that leads into it. For when you're overwhelmed and you're prone to procrastinate, how to get moving at all. So, you know, you're you're pulled in all directions. How do you figure that out? Um, and for those of us who might suffer that overwhelm paralysis, any tips? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the reasons I suggest the Friday planning is you can get this all out there, right? Like, you know, think through all the stuff that's going on. And, you know, sometimes it feels overwhelming, the amount of stuff, but it's going to feel more overwhelming if you don't know what it is, right? Like, it, you know, it's like the difference between canoeing on a river where you can see things or like canoeing through a cave, right? Like it's just, there's a totally different fear factor level. Um, if you can actually see where you are going and see the rocks and walls or whatever that you are dealing with versus if you can't. So, you know, take that time on Friday, think about all the stuff, and then you can start working both in terms of how, you know, sort of important things are. Because even when everything is very urgent, it's very important to like have some amount of time for the long-term goals sort of stuff. And in fact, I'd encourage people to do it first, like carve out some time on Monday morning for the steps toward the long-term goals. Like you're going to get to the stuff you have to. I think, you know, most people on here, if you have survived as an independent journalist this long, you have learned to meet your deadlines, right? Like that's, you know, probably something you're going to do. You are going to meet those, but you may not carve out time for those steps toward your long-term goals. So I'd suggest doing that first, giving that some time first. Be, you know, good about it. like pack your Monday and Tuesday pretty tightly and you know, say, this is, you know, I'm going to devote two hours to this project. And I'm going to devote two hours to this project. And, you know, that's what I'm going to do on Tuesday. I'm going to devote two hours to this project, two hours. To this you can do a fair amount of time if you devote two solid hours to anything. I think people are sometimes surprised, like when they actually sit down and devote time to something, how much they can get done. And then you sort of plan the rest of the week a little bit less tightly because you're going to start seeing like, well, what required more time? What comes up? You know, maybe something took less time and we can fill in things from there. But, you know, by having at least some marching orders for yourself on Friday, you're going to feel like you have a much better shot of getting through those things, right? And sometimes you can even knock off a tiny little thing or two as part of your planning session on Friday. And then you're like, woohoo, I'm feeling even less overwhelmed. Oh my goodness. You know, I am, I am kicking it. Um, and then, you know, as for procrastination, it's it's interesting. I get this question a, a lot and and I, I try to, you know, I'm trying to understand exactly why people are procrastinating because there's different reasons, right? And sometimes it is because you don't really know what you're supposed to be doing. Like the more ambiguous a project is, like the harder it is to get started. So if 
maybe you need more clarity on it. Like what exactly needs to be done? And maybe that's just a phone call or a meeting you need to have with someone to, to be very clear on, well, what is the next step that needs to happen? Or maybe you just need to think about it for a while. Like what would I think should be the next step? Let me make a list of doable steps that would get this project closer to completion. And ideally some of those doable steps are small enough that they don't inspire a whole lot of resistance. Like I've been, you know, I got an extension on my taxes. I've been sort of pushing it for, I don't feel like doing it either, but I broke it down into steps. Like, okay, I'm going to put together all my business credit card statements. Like they're now in a pile, like then I'll go through them and, you know, get the expense numbers added up and then I'll, you know, put my contract stuff. And anyway, it's, it's like all steps, none of which are, are so ridiculous that they inspire a whole lot of resistance. So that's one way to sort of get going on that. Sometimes you just start in the middle like you're not sure how to start, but you're writing an article. Like if you know even one sentence that's going to be in it, write that sentence. And then you're like, oh, well, you know, I probably would say this sometimes after that. And, you know, I'd say this sometime before it. And probably I would put this quote somewhere around there. And next thing you know, you have a patchwork of a thing and you can go in and fill it in. Like it's pretty close to a draft. So that's, uh, you know, the momentum starts, starts going. Um, you can reward yourself profusely, right? Like, you know, promise yourself if I work for this on an hour, I can take the next hour off, like whatever it is, that's going to, going to motivate you. But sometimes, you know, our procrastination is, is telling us something, which is that really, this is not the direction you want to be going with your career. Like this is not the kind of work you want to be doing long-term. I'm not saying you get out of it now. Like if you've agreed to do it, you're not getting out of it now, but like, all that is standing between you and a future where maybe you don't have to do this kind of work again is getting through this now, right? And then you know in the future, like if it looks like that, I really don't want to do that. So do what you can to avoid having to do that in the future. I am. I have to admit, um, you know, Laura, I'm getting a lot out of this. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I I, I feel like it, it, it's it's along the lines of okay, you know, here are some tweaks that we, that'll let me see some, you know, results that, that will be meaningful. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. I think others agree as well. So um, I, I want to, I want to um, ask one, one last question from the audience that that's, you know, come in here. And, uh, and then I want to bring our fearless leader, Catherine Lewis back in for a moment. Um, but the question I want to end on is, you know, um, is there a role that as a professional writer um, that that you follow, maybe not even from this particular book that allows you to think broadly when you need to plan detail when you need to and just make sure that this, you know, sometimes busy and sometimes not profession that we're engaged in um, is serving you in the way you most need? Hmm. Well, I think that you, you know, one of the most fundamental rules is that you want to still be engaged and learning and enjoying yourself. And it can be easy to get burnt out on doing any kind of work, right? And especially, you know, if there's been a lot of distractions, a lot of, you know, difficulties over the last few years in various regards. And, you know, we, we want to be able to enjoy our lives and enjoy our work. And so I think checking in with yourself and saying like, am I enjoying this? Like, I, and not that, you know, you are going to enjoy a hundred percent of your work. I think that would be a pretty hard <laughs> bar to clear for any sort of paying job. Um, but that it's, you know, it, it's enough to make you keep going with it. And sometimes that is about consciously building in the kind of work that you find more fun. Like ask yourself, like, does, do I find this particular task energizing or depleting? And if it's energizing, how can I make sure I have more of that kind of work? Maybe it's certain editors you love to work with. Well, guess what? You shouldn't just be taking what comes in. You should be pitching that person all the time, right? Because you want to work more with them. Um, maybe it's a certain topic. And you don't normally write about that, but you could, right? Like, why not go do more stuff on that, that topic? Or maybe you find you particularly like a different format. Like you, you know, have been experimenting with, with podcasting and that's something that you find incredibly energizing. Whereas, you know, other sorts of work are maybe feeling a little bit more depleting. Well, you could change up the, the offerings that you have. I mean, it's, there's just all sorts of things you can do. And 
you know, when, when you're working for someone else, ideally you'd have a great manager who'd be like, oh yeah, I want to make sure we develop this skill for you. And I could see you doing this in six to 12 months. So let's make sure that you meet these people that will allow you to be able to do that. I, I mean, I know most people don't have that boss. <laughs> like, I mean, I've, I've had enough jobs. Yeah, you don't, you don't usually get that boss, but sometimes you do. And it's really amazing when you do. And you should be that boss for yourself, right? You need to be that boss for yourself. The one who's thinking, what would I like to see Laura doing in six <laughs> to 12 months? Who does Laura need to meet? Who does she need to get in front of that we can we can sort of, you know, get her some exposure to? What should Laura be learning? Right. You know, like if you could actually think about this, even in the third person and think about what your your uber cool boss slash manager would be telling you, um, then I think you can go a long way toward making the career still seem pretty awesome. For those who are at the beginning of their career, this is amazing advice for establish folks who have a trajectory, have a path that they're already beating down. For for folks who are just getting in and who have decided that this wild and wooly, sometimes unwieldy kind of unwieldy kind of job is what they want to do. Any advice for those folks? So one rule I didn't put in the book, but I think would be the tenth rule is that people are a good use of time. And especially when you are early in your career, you just want to meet as many people as possible, right? Like, and you never know who's going to wind up being useful or not. And so you shouldn't approach it from that perspective of whether this person will be useful or not. Just, you know, is this person interesting? Do I enjoy, you know, getting to know this person? Like meet lots of different people in lots of different industries and lots of different places because it all comes back around. You know, it's like somebody you worked with one place, like, Everyone there gets fired, it gets shut down. You're like, well, I guess that was a waste. No, it wasn't. They're all going to wind up somewhere else. And now you got, you know, 10 other places that are a possibility that you might do work with. And so, in fact, you know, if you're on the other side, like you feel bad for them, but it probably turned out better for you in that regard, that they're all over the place now. Um, and, and just like even, you know, people that, you know, even people junior to you, it's worth spending time with them. It might feel sort of altruistic, like, oh, I'm being a mentor. But those people, you know, if they're really good, they may even like leapfrog you in various ways. And then you're like, hey, hey, <laughs> like I know them, right? I knew them when, and they're they're happy for, you know, helping you as well. So I just, you know, and, and, and plus people make life more interesting. Like the more people you know, like the more friends you have, the more, you know, opportunities you have come into your life. So people are a good use of time and just have that in the back of your brain every time you are figuring out how you want to spend your time. Mm, wow. I am, um, I, I, let's see. Um, Catherine just added in the chat that I, I want to make sure you see and get to respond to uh, Laura's that uh, uh, typing fit. Okay. Okay. Uh, a parallel piece of advice on Hillary Sutton's Hustle and Grace podcast, wait a year before asking a new friend or colleague for a favor. So, you know, putting in the time, putting in the work, putting in that contact as people being a good investment of your time, I think is, yeah, that that totally makes sense in, in terms of how you want to be of service to folks too, and not just, you know, calling up people not that I, we're, we we know that nobody's just going to call because they need a favor, but you know, building relationships and and making that uh, making that legitimate way of of interacting something that we do a lot it helps it helps all around yeah, exactly absolutely. So um, I I know hold on there there I know there was a question that came up here. I'm scrolling back to get it because I want to make sure I get everyone, and uh, it's another procrastination question. Uh, so yeah, I, we're writers, you know, we're going to harp on this one. Um, but for, for, uh, this one, I'm, I'm going to add in, do you have a tip to avoid procrastination? You're about to start writing, um, and you know, everything else seems important except writing. Um, but that's where you're going to put your focus. Is there a way before you're in the throes of that procrastination, uh, whirlpool that's sucking you down? When you see that it might be just ahead, uh, are there any ways that you suggest we might work to circumvent or jump over it? Sure. I mean, I mean, one of the best ways, honestly, is just set a timer. Tell yourself, I'm going to work for 20 minutes. That's it. And 
after I've done that, I can go organize my spice drawer to like my heart's content, right? You know, in just 20 minutes. I'm and then and then I can go fold the laundry that needs to be done. Then I can go whatever else you need to do. And usually by the end of 20 minutes, you've done something. And the spice drawer seems slightly less appealing <laughs> because you're like, all right, well, I, I, I'm halfway through this article. Like, I don't, I don't actually need to go organize my spice drawer. So, you know, it, it's, um, but, but if you're feeling a lot of resistance to work, telling yourself it's only 20 minutes, like you could just sit there on your butt for 20 minutes. You know, it, it, it's, it's not that long, right? It, it doesn't, it, it doesn't inspire the same resistance as being like, well, I have to do this till it's done. It's like, no, no, just 20 minutes. Like 20 minutes is all I'm asking of you. You know, just, just have a seat, 20 minutes, then we'll go do whatever you want. And mm -hmm. usually that's enough to get, get through it. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, you know, you are, you have been covering time management for a while now, and I've been reading you for much you know, much as as long as you've been writing, uh, I'm I'm just taking this moment to just fangirl at at this opportunity. <laughs> um, you know, I I I recognize that um, you know nobody can predict the future, nobody can, nobody can make the best laid plans. But one of the things I, I really want you to talk about one more time because I I personally felt impacted when you started talking about it. Um, planning with the you know, with the buffers built in, you know, I am someone who makes perfect plans. And I laughed the other night when I was watching Abbott Elementary, you know, it's in my calendar, we watch Abbott Elementary, yay, Quinta. Um, but but the the character um, uh, played by Tyler James Williams, people knew him as everybody hates Chris. And now he's, you know, Gregory on the Abbott. He he scheduled everything down to two minute blocks <laughs> for the entire school year. Yeah. And at one point he says, this stunt just cost me a whole day of my pre-planning execution. You know? And I'm going, oh my God, is that what I'm like when I actually get it together to plan? That's what I like when I get it together to plan. Um, let's remind folks about buffers. Okay. Let's remind me about <laughs> and, it's a personal and, question, <laughs> you know, and, and frankly, um, just, you know, for a, a lot of us don't understand how to give ourselves a little bit of grace around this. We, we, we spend our time flogging ourselves when we're not doing our best work, um, and doing that hustle grind thing. But I, I imagine as someone who's put in the time to learn how people actually work and, and do their time and what works best. Um, you're the guru, please help me, us, uh, yeah. in terms of planning that's not so oppressive, maybe, if that's the term I want to use. Yeah, well, I mean, you definitely want to plan some stuff that you're looking forward to, right? I mean, like, let's let's twist the, ver the meaning of plan. A lot of people are like, I'm, you know, I don't want to plan because we're planning stuff we don't want to do. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, no, no, I want you to plan things you do want to do. And for instance, when I have people do their Friday planning, I suggest they make themselves a three category priority list for the upcoming week career, relationships, and self. And there should be something in all three categories. So something that's important to you, that's a top priority in all three categories and build it into your schedule. So you know, it's going to happen, right? So that, that can help us feel like planning isn't oppressive right there. Cause we're focusing, you know, not just on what we need to do, but what we want to do, like for our relationships, what we want to do for ourselves and, and treating that as worth time in our schedule. I think like we just need to, I mean, the two minute thing is so hilarious, but it, it, people totally do that. And it's like, you're at an elementary school. Like, have you never even like <laughs> met elementary school children? Like in what world do they do exactly what they're supposed to do for every two minute chunk of time? Um, and I think that's, you know, a really, when I've, you know, talked to really good educators who do think about this it's like they know they know stuff is going to go wrong like that's the nature of being around a lot of young people and stuff is going to come up that you didn't even know was going to happen right so you got to build in space for it to be there and so we definitely have you know key things that we need to hit on in any given you know period of the day or any given day you know this week we have these weekly objectives yes we do have to learn two digit subtraction this week or whatever it is but you know, we're going to focus on getting the material, then we're going to, you know, build in some space and then get, get the material and build in some space. Um, you know, I think it helps to sort of think about our lives objectively too. Like how much stuff takes exactly the amount of time you think it will, right? Like 
almost everything I think <laughs> takes longer than you think it will, right? Like this is, people think about even just the time you are putting on your shoes in the morning, the time you are backing out the driveway, the space between these two is not zero. And if you think it is zero, that explains why you are five to 10 minutes late everywhere. People are like, I thought I left the tower on time. It's like, oh, oh, wait, <laughs> the, there was the shoes. There was the walking down the driveway. There was the putting stuff in the car. There was getting in the car. It's like, oh yeah, that stuff isn't zero. And we, we tend to under think through all this stuff. Um, so, you know, I just, the more I can convince people to see the value of open space and to build their lives with that in mind that, you know, it takes practice. Like we don't have to cram in every minute, but you know, start mm -hmm. asking yourself, like, is this how I would truly like to spend my time versus being on top of everything, you know? And if it isn't, if it just is something that's like less than a five on a 10 point scale, see if you can just get rid of it and leave that space open because probably what will fill it will be more than a five. Ah, okay. Okay. My mouth is less dry and I'm feeling more confident as I'm going to plan my week starting today. Um, just a complete aside, um, at my kid's elementary school, he's in high school now, but elementary school had the we're late to school uh, card and you just check the reason, overslept, doctor's appointment, blah, blah, blah. One of them, because we live in Washington, D.C., was motorcade. We're late to class, <laughs> motorcade. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I must say... Um, yeah, motor motorcade action it happens. is a thing in DC. It and, happens, and, and um, you know, it it impacted my life the other day. Not going to get into the whole damn you Texas Florida. I'm just going to say there were a whole bunch of buses we weren't expecting on the way past the Naval Observatory, and I actually was like, oh my god, I wish I had a motorcade card with me today. So <laughs> to explain why I'm late. <laughs> so yes, yes. All right. Um, we have just a few more minutes remaining. Let me give you the floor, Laura. Is there anything you want people to know, to think about? Is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to bring up, um, particularly about how folks can order the book oh. and, uh, you know, and, and what's in it that we, we can preview and uh, get, get all excited about reading when we, on October 11th, open our very own Coffee. Yes. Well, I, if, if people are, you know, willing to buy it, that would be awesome. You can pre-order it. I have some pre-order bonuses on my website. If you fill out the information there, um, just basically your name and email address, and, and we'll send you an excerpt so you can get started reading. Um, there's a really cool scorecard we've created that you can track how you're doing on the nine rules. Um, I filmed a series called Tranquility by Tuesday in Real Life, in which I have four busy people talking about how four different rules have you know, changed their lives for the better. And so that's a really cool video series that has been released to people who pre-order. Um, so you can see it before it's released to the public if you pre-order the book. So, you know, just a lot of cool stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I know we have a lot of journalists on here. So if you are um, interested in writing about these topics for somewhere or, you know, uh, somewhere that might be interested in interviewing me, I'm really just trying to spread the word as broadly as possible, getting the word out to places. So feel free to get in touch with me, Laura at lauravandercam.com uh, and would love to connect about that. Absolutely. So um, I want to invite our fearless leader, Catherine, back up here. And uh, I, I know she's got some announcements and, and uh, this was, first of all, thank you for allowing me to uh, moderate this conversation. I frankly uh, have uh, learned a lot and I cannot wait to go through this transcript again and be like, do this, Jamila. Um, I'm definitely planning today and I'm going to go to bed at the same time every, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, uh, okay, not, not too much at once. I'm planning today. We're going to see. Thank you both. And uh, Catherine, I want to give you the mic now. Yes, I just want to add my thanks to Laura Vanderkam for the, giving us part of your free Fridays and um, and sharing all of your wisdom. And to Jamila, I hope you saw in the chat the overflowing sentiment that you are such a wonderful, accessible moderator. 
we are uh, with these conversations about time management and productivity i think a lot of us have a little shame right about like things we're not doing that we should supposed be supposed to be doing and i think laura your advice to lead with joy lead with fun uh, can really help us get past that so um, this was a great way to kick off the institute for independent journalists fall webinar series um, we are so new i'm like using a google form <laughs> instead of an actual website but um, thank you all for being here with us please join us on october 21st we are going to have a pitching webinar with editors from the new york times cnn digital and business insider confirmed and i'm hoping for another couple that i'm just waiting on um, on november 11th we're going to have an amazing session about long form narrative journalism, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, how to really make it work with some of my favorite authors and colleagues, Valeria Fernandez, who's an investigative journalist in Phoenix and managing editor of Palabra, Jaya Lee, who's a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine uh, based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and Erica Hayasaki, um, long form journalist and author of the forthcoming Somewhere Sisters, and another person I'm hoping to confirm soon. And that is going to actually be at 1 p.m. Um, Eastern time because they're all on the West Coast. Um, and then on December 9th, we will have a fellowship webinar about how to get paid for some of that long form journalism for being more productive. And um, together with all this, we hope it'll it'll really help inform all of our um, journalism. And I learned so much from listening and planning and talking with all the speakers we have. Laura, I think one of my trade secrets is having you as a colleague and friend to keep me accountable uh, to to what I know I should be doing and and doing it with um, such compassion and, and affection. So thank you both Jamila Bay independent journalist based in Washington DC, and also a leader at the independent Institute for independent journalists, Laura Vanderkam, um, author of time management and productivity books, including the one that I'm actually going to pre order because I want those freebies too. <laughs> <laughs> even though I have it on PDF, I'm going to I, I, I uh, just highly recommend pre-ordering Tranquility by Tuesday, and I'm um, so great to spend the time with both of you. Thanks to everyone for being here, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.